Turn in your Bibles to the book of Romans. This morning we're going to be looking at chapter 3, verses 27 through 31. In Paul's epistle to the Romans... In a message I'm entitling, The Power of Faith, but could easily be entitled, The Benefits of Biblical Faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you and glorify you. Heavenly Father, we know that the word glory is a word that has sort of fallen out of our vocabulary. But it's a wonderful word that describes the sum and the substance of all of the attributes that make you who you are, the self-existent, eternal God who loves us, who sent his son to die for us. And so, Heavenly Father, we pray that you would awaken within our hearts a profound appreciation for grace. Lord, we pray that it would cause us to love Jesus even more. And in turn, Lord, that we could demonstrate that love in tangible ways to one another. In Jesus' name, amen. Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse 27, Paul writes, Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith? Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. In chapter 3, Paul asks and answers a series of questions, six in all. In this particular passage, in verses 21 through 30, are the final two questions. Question number five and question number six. In question number five, Paul asks, how then does God save people? In answering the question, Paul points out the need for salvation in verse 23 and the method of salvation in verse 22, in verse 24, in verse 25, again in verse 27, in verse 28. And then Paul will point out the method of salvation. It doesn't include good works in verses 27 and 28, but rather comes by grace through faith in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ in verses 24 and 25. So what does salvation legally include? Or what does salvation legally accomplish? It permits a holy and a righteous and a just God to declare repenting sinners righteous. Who's eligible? Salvation is available to both Jew and Gentile. And so in the sixth question, Paul asks, does faith make null or make void the reality of of grace and faith and justification in faith. Paul's answer sounds really familiar, particularly to those who are familiar with the New Testament teaching of Jesus. He replies, it's just the opposite. Faith doesn't nullify the law, but rather fulfills the law. So in this passage, Paul plums some of the powerful benefits of biblical faith. Biblical faith makes personal pride as it relates to salvation impossible. It slays the pride of any person who entertains the notion that personal goodness or personal merit 
or personal perfections have anything to do with personal salvation in verse 27. Faith does what the law could never do. It justifies the sinner in verse 28. Faith reveals and affirms the nature of God, that God created everyone and everything. He is the only God, and this God justifies and saves all exactly the same way. By faith in Christ. And biblical faith in Christ provides the one lens where we can look at the law and then come to a proper conclusion about the role and the relationship of the law to the believer in verse 31. So biblical faith upholds and establishes the law in verse 31. So again, let's look at verse 27. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works. No, but by the law of faith. Here's what Paul is pointing out. Biblical faith makes human boasting or bragging impossible. And so Paul will contrast the law of works and the law of faith. No human being can boast in himself or herself before the Lord. We have no real righteousness apart from Christ. There's no real goodness apart from Christ. There's no real merit or virtue apart from Christ. We are, as human beings, soaked, saturated, in pride, John Piper writes, quote, Boasting is the voice of pride in the heart of the strong. Self-pity is the voice of pride in the heart of the weak. Boasting sounds self-sufficient. Self-pity sounds self-sacrificing, but both are really the form of the exact same malady. What do the strong and the weak have in common? Well, for some, their strength or weakness is a constant preoccupation. Daniel Considine wrote, quote, It is our self-importance, not our misery that gets in the way, unquote. Benjamin D'Israeli, a, a former prime minister of, of Britain, used to say, quote, When I want to read a good book, I write it, unquote. Yeah, that tells you what he's thinking about himself. George Bernard Shaw, the famous playwright, wrote, quote, I often quote myself. It adds spice to the conversation. It's almost impossible to not allow pride to leak out. The very famous Greek storyteller Aesop famously said, Two ducks were preparing for their annual flight south for the winter when their friend, Mr. Frog, informed them of his desire to travel along. You have no wings, said the ducks. No, said Mr. Frog. But if you two ducks will kindly hold this stick in your mouths, I will grasp it in the middle with my mouth and we will fly together. <laughs> well, the whole thing went quite well. However, they soon flew over a pasture and there were two cows down eating the grass and they looked up at the trio and one of the cows commented, now there go a couple of intelligent ducks. When Mr. Frog heard this, he couldn't suppress his desire for credit. He said, no, it was my idea. There's something about taking credit that always gets us in trouble. The law of works does not exclude boasting, but rather promotes boasting. The law of works encourages people to stand before God and state what pride thinks is obvious. I'm more acceptable than others. I'm more deserving than others. I've achieved more than others. I'm more sufficient than others. I've never needed anyone but myself. And so the law of works brings focus where it doesn't belong, on the self. It causes people to evaluate the world in relation to themselves. 
to look at themselves as the source of sustenance and provision and purpose and meaning and significance and acceptance. We live in a culture in a society that says, believe in yourself. And the Bible gently but firmly says, look away from yourself. That's not the source of, of redemption and salvation. That's not the source of acceptance. You see, the law of works encourages boasting. No wonder Paul wrote in Romans chapter 12, verse 16, Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. In other words, don't think more highly of yourself. Associate with people who are humble. In James chapter 4, verse 16, James writes, But now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 17, it says, Because you say, I am rich and increased with good, and have need of nothing and knowest not that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, unquote. The writer in Proverbs wrote in Proverbs 3, 7, be not wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord, depart from evil, the scriptures enjoin. So why in the world is it so difficult to believe a person is saved? By grace, alone, through faith, alone. Because in our culture and society, we are conditioned to play down the notion of sin, the problem of sin, the severity of sin. People aren't comfortable with the topic. Add to that the notion, the idea that God might be angry with sin and people leave the conversation and they go to their happy place. When my young Jonathan was growing up, when he didn't want to hear something, he would take both of his fingers, he would stick them in his ears and he would go, la, 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 la. When you're young, it's cute and effective. But when you're older... It's pathetic. Paul knew the heartbreaking reality of not only the danger of sin, but the consequences of sin. And so in our fallen nature, in our pride, we can't bring ourselves often to think that we are as bad as all that. We're prone to think that our goodness or acts of righteousness must be able to make some meaningful contribution to the cost of salvation. And Paul is completely aware that a righteous and holy God cannot tolerate sin. How in the world could God find people who are unacceptable, acceptable? And the answer, of course, is in the good news of the substitutionary death and the resurrection of Jesus. In the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus, God winds up getting the glory. No human being can accept any glory for his or her righteous standing because the glory belongs exclusively to God. So what about the person who insists that keeping the law must be a part of biblical faith and it must be a part of biblical salvation? Paul argues that there can be no boasting. If human beings will do one simple thing, remember, remember what the law says. Remember that the law measures us with relentless impartiality. All boasting ceases if you in fact value reason and memory because the knowledge of the law and then a willingness to embrace the law and a deep desire to follow the law will result in you breaking the law. So, for the person who understands that, for the person who sees the futility of keeping the law, they now will appeal to a new performance. Well, if I can't completely keep the law, well, or if I at least keep the law in the way that I perceive the law, or 
embrace the law or evaluate the law or interpret the law or seek to approve the law in my own life. It isn't exactly what the Bible says, but rather your interpretation of it, and it results in being not accepted by God, but by rejected by God. And so God cuts through the blindness and the wickedness. Both are summarily dismissed by the cosmic judge who finds keeping the law and doing works of righteousness as wholly inadequate. The judge says, It's not by the performance of deeds. It's by the performance of faith. And so Paul speaks of the law of faith. Fitness is found in the law of faith. Not a faith which is law, but a law which is faith. We live in a culture and a society where wrong-headed people think that faith is a force and that your words are the container of the force and that you can use faith like a substance to get what you want. That's not what Paul thinks about faith or the law. He's speaking of a law which becomes faith. Paul claims for faith what the religious Jews claimed for the law. Faith is new. Faith is not bondage. Faith is the law of liberty. Faith and the works of the law then become antithetical to one another. That means they're mutually exclusive from one another. And so then Paul says, biblical faith justifies the sinner apart from the law. Look at verse 28. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Usually when you see the word therefore, I invite you to look and see what it's there for. But this is one of those times where I'm not going to do that. I'm going to suggest to you in the New King James, which reads, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith, that in the original language it's even more pointed. In the original language it says for And then it provides the main thrust for the exclusion of boasting. For we conclude that a man is justified by faith. The reason man, any man, Jew, Gentile, black, white, old, young, living here, living there, living in every circumstance under under the sun, Paul understands that they are justified by faith, and each word is emphatic. The final clause is even more striking by the absence of articles or definite articles in the original language. Instead of just saying, apart from the deeds of the law, it says, without deeds of law. Why is Paul so committed to exclude Jewish boasting and Gentile boasting? I need you to put on your thinking caps just for a moment. And I want you to think carefully about what you're reading. Paul understands something that I think most of you understand. You've talked with your family and you've talked with your friends about Jesus. And you say to them, guess what? Jesus loves you and has a wonderful plan for you. He wants to forgive you. He wants to be in your life and in your heart. And the reality is pride and prejudice are sometimes the only arguments we have left For rejecting Jesus, pride and prejudice. What do I mean? I'm good enough the way that I am. I'm smart enough the way that I am. I grew up in a religious home. I do good things. I say good things. I'm basically a good person. Jesus is for evil people like you. Jesus is for wicked people like you. Jesus is for people who are voted most likely to go to hell. That wasn't me. I was a good person. And they keep saying it over and over and over again. 
hoping that if they say it enough times, that might make it true. And so Paul argues what constitutes an adequate righteousness in the face of consistent personal sin. Does this adequate righteousness apply equally to Jew and Gentile? And so when Paul says a man is justified by grace apart from the law. Do you understand what Paul is doing? He's refusing to budge. He refuses to give up one jot, one tittle. He won't concede not even one inch. In verse 24, Paul has already said, all are justified by the free gift of his grace through being set free in Christ Jesus. He repeats it here. There's no escaping man's sinful condition. There's no adequate righteousness that's available apart from Christ. And so Paul concludes, we are justified by faith, apart from the deeds of the law. In order to understand what Paul means, we have to understand that biblical concept of justification. Justification is an act or a declaration. It's not a process. It's a pronouncement. There are no degrees of justification. It's like when you were a kid growing up and they said, are you kind of pregnant? You're not kind of pregnant. You either are or you're not. There's no kind of justification. You either are or you are not. Justification is something that God does. No human being could ever do it. No sinner can justify himself or herself before God. More importantly, justification doesn't mean that God makes us forensically or intrinsically righteous, but rather he declares us righteous. Let me give you an example. Is it possible that a person can be as guilty as sin and stand before a judge and the judge declares them not guilty. It is possible, isn't it? According to the law, that person is not guilty. Some of you are thinking, how can God, how can God just all of a sudden say, not guilty? Because he's rendering a verdict. He's making a legal pronouncement. on the basis of what Jesus has done, on the basis of the life of Jesus and the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. It's a legal pronouncement that God honors. God writes or places or puts the righteousness of Christ in the place of our record. In other words, when you look at your record, all of a sudden God expunges your record. Instead of your past and your present and your future, he writes one word, Jesus. He writes the name Jesus in the place of your sinfulness. And even though some of you know that, I need to tell you something that you also may know, but that you frequently forget, and that is nobody can change the record. Do you understand what I just said? Nobody can change the record. Even though some people might want to. You know, I know that God has declared you righteous in Jesus, but I think you're a creep. I know that God has declared you righteous in Jesus, but you offend me by everything you say and everything that you do. So you have a couple of choices. You can be consistently upset by what other people think about you, or you can put on your happy face and go, I'm going to heaven and you can't stop me. I'm going to heaven. 
I've experienced the grace and the mercy of God in Christ. The Puritan preacher Thomas Watson got it exactly right when he wrote, God does not justify us because we are worthy, but by justifying us makes us worthy. Henry Smith noted, quote, He hideth our unrighteousness with his righteousness. He covereth our disobedience with his obedience. He shadoweth our death with his death. That the wrath of God cannot find us. Can you imagine? God does what only God can do. He places your sin in a place where even he can't find it. And so for this reason, everyone who appeals to culture or geography or religion or superstition or even to reason or equity of justice in order to find justification apart from Christ is engaged in a losing battle. Every single person who says, I want to find a way to be saved apart from Christ, it will never happen. It can never happen. You heard me say it over and over again, and I repeat it again. There is no satisfying solution to the problem of sin apart from Christ. And so look what he writes. Biblical faith reveals one true God who deals with all equally. Look at verse 29 and 30. Or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. You might think, well, this is pretty obvious, but I need you to understand part of the point that Paul is making. The Jewish people could claim that his God was the true God, his religion, the revealed religion, his Bible, the inspired Bible, given by God, containing the very word of God. Again, Paul reminds the Jewish reader that righteousness doesn't arise from the giving of the law, but rather it reveals a sinful condition that is shared by Jew and Gentile alike. And so Paul makes note that God will admit no racial advantage. There is no racial advantage to being Jew or Gentile, black or white, blind or lame, living in another country under another name. There's only one way of justifying sinful human beings. There's not a Jewish way. There's not a Gentile way. There's not an Arab way. There's not a Hindu way. There's not a Native American way. Paul writes, we're all in the same boat. We're all equally lost. Paul argues we can all be equally found in Christ. I want you to think about Paul's argument for just a moment. For the Jew who insists, you must keep the law. In order to be saved, in order to be justified, in order to be accepted, in order to be redeemed. Paul points out the absurdity of the argument. For in order for that to be true, Paul is making the point, if that's true, then there has to be two gods. I want you to pause for just a moment. If there are two ways of salvation, then there are two gods. If there are four ways of salvation, then there are four gods. If there are six ways of salvation, then there are six ways. But Paul says there's only one God and one way. Because one God will not save men by two opposing methods. Paul is contending. Let me put it differently. Paul is not contending for justification by faith. That's a settled issue. He said it in verse 26. He said it in verse 28. What Paul is arguing for now is its exclusivity. That this is the only true doctrine. The Jew who claims the works of the law saves has to admit that God isn't really God or that there must be another God. How do you explain the fact did God, by Moses, give the law to the Jews? What's the answer? Did he give the law to the Gentiles? If the law is what saves you, 
by only giving it to the Jews, doesn't that imply some sort of exclusivity? Isn't it an automatic condemnation for everyone who doesn't receive the law? And so here's what Paul is arguing. The Jew who claims that the works of the law saves has to admit that God isn't really God. How then do you explain the fact again that the Gentiles didn't receive the law? The Jew admits, no, no, no. That's not what the Bible says. That's not what the scriptures say. The the Jew, the honest Jewish person has to admit that God is the God of the Gentiles. The Old Testament gives abundant proof In Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Psalms, the prophets, Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 7, that God is the king of the nations. It is his rightful due. The ministry of Jesus admits that God is the God of the Gentiles. In Mark chapter 12, verses 29 through 32, in the famous passage where Jesus is asked about the greatest commandment, and you'll remember what Jesus says. Haven't you read? Shema Israel, Echad. Eloheinu la, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is, how many gods are there? One. There is one singular God. If there's one singular God, then God must be the God of all people everywhere. And so, since there's only one God, There's only one satisfying solution to the problem of sin. Think about it. Verse 30, since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. What does Paul mean by circumcised and uncircumcised? Again, he's making reference to the Jewish person and the Gentile person. If so, be that God is one. Paul emphasizes the singularity, the unity. And since there's one single God, there's one singular salvation. A righteous judge can't render contradictory judgments where all have equally and unmistakably and irrefutably broken the law. Can you imagine one judge says to the Jew, you've broken the law but I find you not guilty because you're a Jew and because you've received the law. Gentile, I find you guilty. You've never received the law, but I find you guilty. Would a just and a holy and a righteous God have two standards of justice? That's impossible! A righteous judge will enter a righteous verdict. But when a righteous judge enters a righteous verdict, a righteous judge can't of necessity include one and exclude another. So salvation by faith alone excludes all other ways. There are not two gods. There's only one God. Therefore, anyone who can be saved has to be saved in a singular fashion, by grace, through faith. Paul argues there's one God, one means of justification, which results in a singular salvation. You need to understand something. It's not me, the pastor, who insists on singular salvation. It's not even the church that insists on singular salvation. The Bible says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. The Bible says that apart from Christ, there is no satisfying solution to the problem of sin. God demands faith. Special claims of preference are refused. Circumcision doesn't give you special favor. Revelation and religion doesn't give you special favor. Ignorance and isolation doesn't give you special favor. The Jews have to follow the narrow road and the Gentiles have to avoid the broad road. This is why Jesus says, 
Narrow is the way that leads to salvation, and there are few that find it. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. The apostle's argument is irrefutable. It's unanswerable because it's based on history and solid theology backed up by the law and the prophets. And so Paul in verse 31 will say, do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. I want to draw particular attention to the word law. In verse 31, here the law doesn't simply mean the moral law. It doesn't simply mean the ceremonial law. Here the law means the sum and the substance of the revelation that's been given by God. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, make your way through the entire Old Testament. Every chapter, every verse, it is the sum and the substance of the revelation in its entirety. And so Paul writes, we establish the law. In what way? Remember, in chapter 5, Paul is going to reveal that righteousness by faith is in perfect harmony with the Old Testament scriptures. So when we exercise biblical faith, do we make void the law? Does faith and justification by faith make void the law of Moses? No, it establishes it. Again, think carefully. Not by the keeping of the law, but rather through the fulfilling of the law in Christ. Paul argues, no, biblical faith establishes the law. In what way? In what way does biblical faith establish the law? Well, what does the law say? God is righteous and holy. What does the law say? God requires righteousness and holiness in his people. What does the law say? There's a demand for righteousness. What does the law say? Everyone breaks the law. What does the law say? We fail to perfectly obey the law. What else does the law reveal? The penalty for lawbreakers. The soul that sins shall surely die. Perfect righteousness and holiness takes place when God declares human beings to be righteous and holy in Jesus Christ. So again, what's the purpose of the law? To lead people to Jesus so that they can be saved by faith. He will go to extraordinary lengths to explain that to the Galatians. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 23 through 26. As a matter of fact, I feel compelled to read it to you. Galatians chapter 3, verse 23. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we're no longer under a tutor, for you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. William MacDonald writes, quote, The gospel tells us how Christ died to pay the penalty of the broken law. He did not treat it as a thing to be ignored. I want to pause in the quote with William McDonald. He did not treat it as a thing to be ignored. He did not treat it as a thing to be ignored. But that's something that almost everyone wants to do. Well, I don't want to read the Old Testament. I don't want to read the Bible. I don't want to go to church. I don't want to listen to the message. I just want to pretend like this whole sad and sorry thing never happened. But the Bible makes it abundantly clear. We can't ignore the problem. By ignoring the problem, the problem won't go away. McDonald continues, He paid the debt in full. Have you ever been in debt? And did it preoccupy you morning, noon, and night? You wondered how you might be able to get out from under the debt. You hated to think about it because of the, the strain and the pain that it created in your life. 
McDonald writes, Now anyone who has broken the law can avail himself of the fact that Christ paid the penalty on his behalf. Thus, the gospel of salvation by faith upholds the law by insisting that its utmost demands must be and have been fully met, unquote. An English Bible teacher and translator, William Tyndale, who actually brought the word atonement into our language, saw the progression. He wrote in the 14th century, quote, note now the order. First, God gives me light to see the goodness and righteousness of the law and mine own sin and unrighteousness, out of which springeth repentance. Then the same Spirit works in my heart, trust and confidence to believe in the mercy of God and His truth, that He will do as He promised, which belief saves me, unquote. Which belief is that? The confident belief that God saves me in Christ. The law of faith does what the law of Moses could never do. The law of Moses can make you conscious of sin. The law of faith makes you the companion of Christ. So the Lord Jesus conquers my pride and then controls me by his love and the Creator becomes our companion. I want you to think about that for just a moment. Can the law conquer your pride? Let me ask you a yet another way. Has the law ever conquered anyone's pride? Can the law control you? Yes. But it's never a control that's motivated by love. Paul's made his point. If God has done everything and you've done nothing, you don't have anything to brag about. For the person who insists that they're good or that they've done enough to merit salvation, they neither understand the nature of God nor do they understand the problem of sin. But God obeys his own law in working out the plan of salvation. If salvation is through the law, then men would have reason to boast. But the truth about the law and the principle of justification by faith alone in Christ alone makes pride impossible. There's an old story that illustrates a powerful point. An extremely wealthy man possessed an incredible collection of art. In his vast collection, there were some of the finest known works of art. And the man had one son. And his son was, for the most part, a lively boy, a wonderful boy, a lovable boy, an ordinary boy. And the young man tragically died in his late teens. And his father loved him dearly. And he died of a broken heart only a few weeks after the passing of his son. And the father's will provided that everything be sold at auction. And strangely, the father stipulated that an oil painting of his son be the first item offered by the auctioneer. And large crowds came to bid on the widely reputed collection of art. And in keeping with the proviso of the will, the boy's portrait was the very first to come up for bid. But no one cared about the deceased boy. The auctioneer said, do I have a bid? No one entered a bid. Do I have a bid? No one entered a bid. After several moments had passed... The young man's constant companion, an African-American man who was hired by his father, who developed an uncommon affection and commitment to the boy, offered 75 cents for the portrait. He loved the boy. And he wanted to honor his memory. And no one even registered to a bid. And the dramatic moment came. The sale stopped. All further objects were suspended for sale because the father further stipulated that the one, the one person who purchased the son's portrait would receive everything. It's not an illustration that you can purchase your salvation even for 75 cents. The illustration, of course, is exactly this. This. 
The point of the illustration is how one's man lo- one man's love for a neglected and overlooked boy could result in receiving a vast inheritance. In this world, God offers human beings the one thing that he values more than the world and more than all worlds. And that's his son. The illustration, of course, is this. With love for the son comes an incomprehensible inheritance. And again, we understand why John can write so pointedly. He who has the son has the father. He who has the Son has life. This is why the Bible keeps pointing you back to the one incomprehensible possession that means you will have everything forever. And that's Jesus. By the way, in chapter 4 and chapter 5, He's going to illustrate justification by faith. And in chapter 5, he's going to talk about the results of justification by faith. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray for that person who for whatever reason has completely misunderstood you and has completely misunderstood salvation. That there was some nagging Suspicion that maybe they had to do something or say something or be something in order to be accepted by you. When in fact the one thing, the only thing that would result in acceptance is what you've wanted all along. A love for and a commitment to Jesus to know Him, to love Him, to honor Him, to embrace Him, to believe Him. And Heavenly Father, I pray for that person who for whatever reason finds themselves far, far away from You, in a dark place, in a lonely place. Lord, I pray that they would confess what everybody already knows that they're sinners in need of a savior, that they want to experience forgiveness of sin, and that they desire to be the companion of Jesus. Lord, I pray that they would pray this very, very simple prayer and mean it with all of their heart. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sin. I've come to believe that Jesus Christ is both King and Lord, that he died on the cross for my sin and he rose from the dead and he's alive. And because he's alive, not only can he change me and forgive me, but I can love him and walk with him and serve him. And that's exactly what I want. That's exactly what I need. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand.